Fora TV. The world is thinking. So I used to play pool. I used to play billiards quite seriously. Um, I played about two to three hours a day from age 19 to age 23. And while I never became a, uh, a really great player, I got close. I got close to being really, really good. There's, uh, there's something you need to play a game really well that I, I don't have. You have to have this, not just competitive spirit, you have to have this sort of killer instinct. Uh, Willie Moscone, who was the second huge star of billiards in the middle 20th century, Willie Moscone said that in order to be a good pool player, you had to be willing to spot your grandmother. Spot means give her. You had to be willing to give your grandmother 49 points. You had to be willing to give your grandmother a 49-point lead in a game to 50 points. You had to be willing to give her a 49-point lead, and then you had to be willing to beat her. And I don't have that. I don't have that bone in me. I don't have that killer instinct. Um, I'm competitive, but I got as good at pool as I've gotten at a bunch of other skills. I got good enough to see how a truly good and excellent practitioner is, but not good enough to match them. And I, many of you, I'm in a room full of skill collectors, I know, and many of you know that once you start to learn something, you start to really understand how really good people are that can do it. You start to see how advanced what they're doing is. There are subtleties. I mean, in pool, someone once said that uh, in order, the, the ability in billiards and pool to sink a ball into a pocket is only 20% of playing the game. And it took me three years, about a thousand hours of playing pool before I actually understood what they meant. The theaters that I cut my teeth on in San Francisco and there was a lot of them, Berkeley Rep, Climate Theater, Eureka Theater, Beach Blanket Babylon, George Coates Performance Works, Project Arteau. Um, that ability to play well with others gives you a tremendous amount of opportunity. Theater is all about the big picture, literally the big picture. It's about what's going on on stage. Therefore, while the prop should look pretty good, it's going to be seen from about this far away, so it doesn't have to be perfect. It's the prop is telling a story. It's not the thing in and of itself. Everyone works towards telling the story. I never see... <laughs> the other thing the prop needs to be is indestructible. I never cease to be amazed at how actors could destroy welded steel things in one show just by seemingly handling it. At any rate, the cogs in the machine of theater need to talk to each other which is good because theater people, I found, are really talkative by nature. And since the process in theater is about a zillion years old, I mean, there's very little difference between a production of Hamlet today and a production of Hamlet 300 years ago. Because this process is so old, there's very little secrecy, which means that there's plenty of room to learn, which was good for me because one of the things that I had learned up till then was that I was good at learning skills. And in theater, I became like a sponge. Uh, carpentry, electronics, rigging, upholstery, lighting, set design, set painting. Everything I could get my hands on, I pointed towards, I asked if I could try it. Sometimes I tried it for free until I had the skills to get paid to do it. But I reached out and grabbed everything that I wanted to learn. Theater, as I've said before, I've talked biographically before, theater led to a job in film. Uh, which is like theater on steroids in, in some respects. There are differences, there's more secrecy. Um, people are, are a little more highly specialized. Uh, there are bigger budgets, which always means more micromanaging and more stress. Uh, but in film, I learned that this wide array of skills that I brought was an asset. There's this thing that happened once I started doing special effects. Everything I'd done up till then was a job that I got paid to do, was something that paid the rent. So I would go and do my job at a theater, and then I'd come home, and I'd make some sculpture or I'd make a robot, or I'd do something that I wanted to do. And when I started really rolling into, into the film industry, into special effects, I just noticed after about six months that I hadn't made any sculpture. And having spent time shifting my attention from skill to skill, I knew that I could only focus my attention on one thing at a time. And there came this point at which I felt like I was making a transition from being a sculptor to working in special effects like I was applying all of my creative skill in this new field. And 
it was weird. It was a departure. I was willing to go with it because the money was really good. And at 26 years old, I finally felt like I had found something that was a viable career, something that I could actually call a career. I also made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to say that I used to be an artist. I know my mental processes, I know what they do, and I know how important they are to my makeup. So I knew that the same thing was happening whether I was animating beer for a commercial or I was making a sculpture. Now, the output is different. One is I'm making something, a product for someone else. But in that small regard of the creative output, of the problem solving, for me, the result at that point was the same. I was diving into this new career, and I said, I'm never going to say I used to be a sculptor. This is the same bones being, being moved around, being, being challenged. Uh, this gets into a deeper philosophical conversation about art as problem solving, but suddenly in this film industry, applying my creative energy, all of these disparate skills came into focus. Uh, each one became like an arrow in my quiver. I'm not an expert. I've never been an expert in any one of these skills, but the total gave me this edge. I was fast. I could innovate. I didn't mind changing direction on the fly. I wanted challenges. I learned really fast. I've said some of this before, but what I wanted to talk about today, this is all an introduction to talking about problem solving. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my process of problem solving. Uh, there are questions, basically I look at everything as, a, as problem solving. Um, and Francis Bacon, the painter, talks about this in a fantastic book called The Brutality of Fact. He's one of the only artists I've ever read who actually can speak about things like truth and beauty and he doesn't mean these disparate out in the world concepts. He's actually talking about very specific ideas that he has and he, he talks about them very articulately. He says that every artist starts a project with a problem to solve. And even if it's an abstract painter, they, they, they have some type of formalism they want to apply to the canvas. And this problem solving, when you embark upon it, you embark upon a goal, you, you go through a set of steps. And I wanted to talk about my set of steps. So the first question I ask myself is, what is the problem I'm solving? And while this seems trivial and simple, you have to be super, super clear about this. If you've been given a problem to solve by someone else and you don't check to make sure you know what that, pro what that problem you're solving is, <laughs> you're going to screw it up because you and the person who's given you that project aren't really clear. Jamie has this thing which he calls drilling the hole on the X. Um, it is a test that many in our shop have failed. Jamie gives somebody a piece of wood with an X drawn on it and says, please drill a hole on the X. You'd be amazed at how many people have not been able to do that. They come back with four holes. Well, I thought maybe it should be this way. Or they come back with a hole near the X, but not quite on. It's, it's unbelievable. You need to be clear about what problem you're solving. Second question, and I go back and forth about which one of these is more important. But in this order, second question is, what is the big picture? And this is one that uh, I've noticed that um, not a lot of people ask. Some people ask it. Those people that ask it that want to know what the big picture is, I always want to work with them more. Where does the problem that I'm currently solving fit into a larger array? Am I solving just a singular problem in and of itself, or is what I'm doing going to fit into something bigger? How does it fit in? Can you see the whole picture? Sometimes you can't see the whole picture you need to see how what you're doing is going to relate to other things. Otherwise, it's not going to relate to other things. In that case, I keep asking the question, can I see the whole picture? And there are times, I mean, honestly, for the water slide episode, I knew how that water slide was going to work. I knew we were going to lay down plywood, we we're going to lay down carpet, we we're going to lay down vinyl. It's actually pretty straightforward. The problems to solve weren't the overall picture. They were actually more like, how do you move 50 sheets of plywood in a reasonable period of time to build the ramp in two days? Uh, how do you grease down the ramp with soap, etc.? cetera? Um, so in those cases, I see the big picture easily. It's how the small parts all line up in an amount of time that's reasonable. And as I go, I keep asking that question. Can I see the big picture now? And you keep on noticing, I keep on noticing that as I keep on going, I fill in bigger and bigger parts of the picture. How much time do I have? Is there a deadline? Now, 
the Maker Faire is all about DIY and tinkering and working, working on your own projects, working on things that you want. I do a tremendous amount of that, and I thrive on deadlines. I find that if I don't have a deadline, I don't get things done. I want to give myself a challenge. If I'm, even if I'm doing something, I might be doing something like I have to make 40 of something. As I'm doing 40 of something, I'm thinking, well, how long is it taking me to do this one? Oh, three and a half minutes. Okay, three and a half minutes, I've got 40 to do, times that, it's gonna be da 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 da. How much time am I gonna finish by four o'clock? I wonder if I can finish earlier. Am I going, to, am I, is there a way to make this process go faster? And I start doing, the math I do in my head as I go becomes this sort of zen meditation as I'm working. But it's all racing against the clock, and it actually also keeps me involved in the drudgery. I mean, doing repetitive tasks is really difficult. It's a key part in making anything. And it keeps my mind on the total goal when I, when I give myself those time, those time constraints. How am I doing now? Uh, that's a key component of how much time do I have? How much time do I have now? How much time do I have left? Where am I in terms of the goal that I'm going to reach? How precise do I have to be? This is actually a really big one. How precise do I have to be? Uh, the difference, if I hand you a board and say, drill me six holes in it about six inches apart, well, one way you could do it is literally just to estimate and drill me six holes, and that takes about a minute. Another way is to go find a ruler and find a pen and carefully measure it all out, and then you've taken 15 minutes and, like, I'm asleep at that point. It depends upon uh, how precise you have to be. Do I need the holes every, exactly every six inches, or do I need them approximately every six inches. And this also has to do with how it's going to be seen. Is this something that needs to fit with another part, in which case it does need to be precise, or is it something that can be really loosey-goosey? No one's going to see it, it doesn't even matter. Another question I ask, what's my rhythm? What is my rhythm and how does it fit into this project? Um, I have learned very, very much in myself a, a, a workflow that I like. Uh, I like to work fast. I like to work fast and my crew knows intimately that I hate to look for things. So before I start a project, I go everywhere in the shop and I get every tool that I need and I put it on the table and I get every material that I need and I put it on the table and I get everything lined up so that I don't have to move once I'm in the sluice. Once I'm rolling, I want to keep on rolling. That's my rhythm. And if there's a project where that rhythm's going to get broken, I want to know so I can, I can actually anticipate it. This actually reached a level of absurdity when I was a, a model maker at Industrial Light and Magic. I had these toolkits, which you can see on my website. They're aluminum doctor's bags. And I filled them full of all the tiny, tiny tools that you, that you use as a model maker. Uh, it ended up being something over about 550 some odd tools. And because I hate looking for anything, even in those toolboxes, I managed to arrange them so that I could reach and grab every single tool without moving another tool out of the way. I actually ended up referring to it as first order retrievability. Um, and in the end, even leaning over into my toolbox was too much for impatient me, and I put them on scissor lifts so that as I sat at my chair, they were at either side, and I was able just to work and work and put things back and work and move things, and it made me fast, and that's the way I like to work. Unbroken, like, thrush. What are my resources? Resources come in several categories, and they all bear upon the, what the problem that you're solving is. Um, the budget. Is there a budget? Do you have control over it? If I do, how much latitude do I have? If it's my money, what is the project worth to me? When I was starting out, I actually, there was a whole class of jobs that I took that uh, I would do the job for free for labor. The labor would be free, but I'd ask the parts that I was using to be paid for on condition that I get to keep the object when I'm done. And this satisfied me on a lot of fronts because I do like special effects props for films and then I get to keep this cool prop at the end, and the, 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 the advantage to me is twofold. One, I love keeping things that I've built. Uh, two, if I know I'm gonna keep it, I'm more invested in it. And three, I'm basically getting someone else to pay me how to learn how to work a new process often. Um, location. Wait a second, where am I? Here we are, budget. Budget is large. If it's your money, I've gotten to that. Location, facility location. Does the place I'm working, I'm solving this problem in, help or hinder the process? Um, I've worked in some really tiny spaces. And I've also, you know, sometimes there's a budgetary constraint. We can't afford the big space, we have to work in the smaller space. But we only have X amount of time. And I have 
learned over the years to examine closely those little trade-offs because working in the smaller space may make the project take more time and become more expensive because you're working in a crappy space than it would be to invest at the front end in a space that's reasonable. Um, when you're thinking about location and solving a problem, for us on the show, it comes up all the time. Even the, uh, what season it is, what's the temperature, uh, what is the weather? Uh, we've now, now that with the iPhones um, on Mythbusters, we're actually regularly looking at the Doppler radar of our location to see how the shoot is going to go. We were doing that just last week. Uh, and yeah, temperature, humidity. In model making, in special effects, there are entire classes of processes that will screw you if the humidity is too high or too low. And even down to like watching paint dry. And on a super humid day, the paint's not going to dry very well. But there are, there are mold making processes that if it's too humid or too rainy or too dry, they're just not going to work. People. How many people do I have? Is the team big enough? Is the team too big? Uh, the team too big can be just as bad as the team not being big enough. What is their morale like? Is it late? Are we trying to solve a problem after everyone's been working a full day? Or are they fresh? Um, do I have all the skills necessary? Do I have all the skills necessary? Um, and, commensurate with that, do I have a realistic understanding of what my skill level is for the problem I'm about to solve? It seems weird that I'm, I'm going down this really fairly long list, but it really is, I, I realized as I sat down and wrote this over the last couple of weeks, this is a checklist I go through for every, every project. Um, if I'm not very good at something, is there enough time for me to get good at it, to finish it, or do I have to farm it out? How long is that person going to take? I, I took lessons in playing pool from a former hustler, uh, an illustrator named Bob Kipnis, who lived in my hometown. He was actually a friend of my dad's for years before I knew he had been a pool hustler professionally for about 20 years. And uh, I grew up with a pool table in the house, so I asked Bob to come over every now and then to teach me some things about pool. And Bob kind of rocked my world. He actually said that pool is really, really simple. He said that when you get into the crouch on the table, you're only asking yourself a few really, really simple questions. You're thinking, where is my cue going to hit the cue ball? Where on the cue ball? What is the cue ball? Where is the cue ball going to hit the object ball? And what are both balls going to do after they collide? He said, if you can go into the crouch and answer all three of those questions every single time you go into the crouch, you're going to be a great pool player. And again, it took me another year of playing before I saw how, how not only true that was, but also how terrifyingly difficult it is to actually do something like that, to ask those questions every single time you do something. It's a very difficult meditation. Um, so while I'm working, those are the broad checklist of things that I look at when I'm embarking upon solving a problem. And obviously, all my, most of my problems on Mythbusters are uh, are building problems, but uh, many of them are also narrative problems. We're, we're telling a story as we go. That story changes as we go because we're telling the story honestly, and we often have to figure out where we are within the narrative. But as we go, there is a set of questions which are being asked constantly. Literally every five minutes these questions are being asked. Um, how important is this particular step? How important is it that I get it right? Can I screw it up? Or do I only have one bar of this special type of unobtainium? Uh, is my machine deteriorating, i.e. me or the tools that I'm using? Is this a step I might be able to improve later so that what I'm building is a stand-in for my solution? Am I missing something stupid? Am I being too clever? Which is another way of saying, am I missing something stupid? Is there a simpler way? Which is another way of saying, am I being stupid? Am I missing something stupid? Am I sure how what I'm doing fits into the larger picture? This is actually, I've talked about this before. Jamie and I have very different working styles, but we both actually have the same mechanism, which is we have to build something in our heads before we can build it in the world. And sometimes you, you can't see the totality of what you're doing. We just finished this um, repeating arrow machine gun that was supposedly designed about 2,300 years ago. And the device was so complicated that Jamie and I had to build a scale model. And then we had to progress about three quarters of the way towards building the full scale model before we both fully understood the total machine. Now, we also have experience with our, with our 
with our process to know what we can and can't fudge with as we go. Uh, but as we're going, we're constantly taking this machine that we're building and putting the parts that are going into the mental picture, into that mental 3D model. What does the whole picture look like now that I've solved this specific part? So in the end, the, the three questions that I'm always asking are, you know, uh, how where does this step fit into the whole now that I've completed it? Am I missing something stupid? And how does the whole look now that I've completed this step? Ah, and how much time do I have now? Again, I love setting artificial goals. If there is no specific deadline, I love setting even an artificial deadline, like I want to finish before I go to lunch. I love finishing things before I go to lunch. Uh, do I want to paint what I'm making? Do I want to add some extra process or make it pretty when I'm done? Uh, sometimes I'll race to the end of a project just so I can paint it in a way that'll annoy Jamie once we're finished. <laughs> um, I also want to describe that this is not a linear process. It is uh, on a graph, it goes all over the place. And there is a part that I have learned, and it doesn't, at the three quarter point in every project that I do, about the 75% mark. I finished most of the work. I can see the end, but it still seems kind of far away. At that point, in almost everything that I, that I work on, I reach this point where I think, I have no idea what I'm doing. And it started, well, I mean, it's been there forever. It got really bad when I was at Industrial Light and Magic. I would be working on something, and I, you know, I work quite, quite fast, so I often build things two and three times before I'm finished with the final thing. But I'd build something and it would be wrong, and I'd build something and I'd be wrong, and I'd be waiting for someone to come up and tap me on the shoulder and be like, it's time for you to go. You have, clearly have no idea what the hell you're doing. But I've learned that that's a part of the process. I've learned that even though I always feel like that, and it, it, I have to actually address it intellectually, because emotionally I always reach this point. And I actually have come to respect it as this part of it's kind of an honest intersection with how mystifying this process is. Honestly, every time I've embarked on a project where I thought, I know how to do this, I have screwed it up. Every single project I have sauntered into thinking, I got this wired, I, I, I messed it up. I talked about that last year. And at the end, honestly, there's almost never this like fist bumping, pump your fist in the air moment where you're like, yeah, I did it, I finished the project. Even when things I've been working on on my workbench for 10 years, when I finally finish them, it's not like I go, oh, yes, I, I'm just really satisfied it's done. It's actually like a, a, a much more quiet and personal moment. Um, it's almost even sometimes a little bit sad. It's a little bit sad to have finished that project. You start to think maybe, maybe it could be better. Maybe I should make a, maybe there should be another one. Maybe, uh, maybe I need three. Maybe someone I know wants one. The main question is, what's the next project? And there is always another project. Thank you.